Hello and welcome to An Old Man Watches and today I will be talking about Brian De Palma's 1978 supernatural thriller The Fury and I'll start by saying I think that's a that's a really cool cover that they put on the Criterion Collection DVD of this film. I just love the stark black and white and red. I think it works really well. Um, the film, in the meantime, uh, begins in Israel, where aging CIA agent Peter Sanza is meeting an old friend, Childress. Um, Sanza is retiring from the espionage game, and perhaps to underline his determination to quit, he's brought his adult son, Robin, with him to the meeting. Seems something of an odd choice to me. Uh, certainly it's an unfortunate one, because the meeting is interrupted by an apparent terrorist attack. Now this attack has actually been staged by Childress. Uh, you see, Peter's son Robin has demonstrated psychic powers, uh, and the shadowy organisation for whom Childress works has no intention of losing access to a possible weapon like that. <coughs> Sansa is a smart guy. He's not fooled by the mock attack, but he is nearly killed by it. Uh, he does escape, but is heavily injured in the process and loses Robin to his attackers. Months later, a high school student Gillian Bal Balava discovers her own psychic powers and her lack of control over those powers threatens those around her. So she eagerly accepts an invitation to work with the Paragon Institute, an institution which studies psychic phenomena and purports to be able to help her. Would it surprise you to learn that Paragon is the front, end, front for the same organisation that kidnapped Robin? Probably not. Uh, and Gillian finds this secret out soon enough when she accidentally forms a psychic bond with Robin and becomes aware of the abuse he is suffering. Uh, Childress immediately orders her to be kidnapped as well and taken to the, uh, the secure location where they're holding Robin. Uh, but this attempt is thwarted by the now healed Peter Sansa, who hopes that Gillian can lead him to his son. However, given the abuse and torture Robin Sansa has suffered in the meantime, will he still be physically and mentally intact by the time his father reaches him? The Fury was reasonably successful with critics and audiences upon release, but it's safe to say it's not one of Brian De Palma's best remembered movies. Uh, certainly it's not had the longevity and notoriety of his big 80s hits like Blowout, Scarface or The Untouchables. Why is that? Well, I think there are a few reasons that this falls a little short of what it could be and why it is less memorable than some of those other films. And as you might expect, I'm going to tell you about those reasons. So first of all, De Palma's breakout success with the film he made immediately prior to this one, 1974's Carrie, uh, based on the Stephen King novel, uh, in which a late onset puberty triggers the psychic powers of a young woman who suffers from an abusive home life and from bullying at school. After a particularly horrific example of the latter, she uses her newfound powers to wreak bloody, in several senses of the word, vengeance on those who have hurt her. Now, The Fury's got a lot of different details in its plot than Carrie. Uh, it adds a shadowy government conspiracy, for one thing, and we have Kurt Douglas's action dad, Peter Sansa, a good 30 years before Liam Neeson would warn some guy on the telephone that he has a very particular set of skills. Uh, but there are definitely some obvious them thematic similarities, uh, given that both this film and Carrie are heavily focused on people with psychic powers, including in both cases a female high, uh, female high school student, and that the mistreatment of those empowered people leads to messy outcomes. And, you know, let's remember, it was the very first film that Peter De Palma did after Carrie. Uh, I feel that going back to thematically similar films, back-to-back uh, -back on thematically similar films, was, was not the best of choices creatively. A longer gap would have allowed the next film to stand more on its own and not be so obviously compared to pre its predecessor, which, of course, many reviewers inevitably did. You make Carrie and then you make this film back to back, they're gonna they're gonna compare the two. And it may have had another effect too. You see, De Palma is best known for his take no prisoners approach to filmmaking. Whether it be technical stuff like the grandiose twelve minute tracking shot that opens his nineteen ninety eight box office failure snake eyes, the stark climactic punch of blowout, or the unrestrained profanity and violence of Scarface. This is not a man who generally does things by halves. He certainly didn't in Carrie, the climax of which involves literal gallons of fake blood. However, De Palma seems to have reined in his usual flamboyance in The Fury. I have to wonder if that was a deliberate attempt to create a sense of distinction between this film and the similarly themed Carrie. Perhaps, perhaps not. It could simply be that with a much larger budget and a much bigger star to handle, De Palma felt like he needed to show a bit more restraint. 
But whatever the reason, I think that the more subdued approach may have adversely impacted the Fury's longer-term position in De Palma's oeuvre. Uh, where most of your work is no holds barred, it's likely a lot of your fans are going to enjoy that aspect of your, of your films. They may even be fans because of it. A film lacking that characteristic, therefore, might not enjoy the same appreciation. Now, this is not to say that changing things up is necessarily a bad idea, um, but I do think that the Fury would have benefited from, at times, a little less restraint and a little more De Palma flamboyance. Now, the thematic similarity to carry and the comparative low-key direction and content of the Fury are not going to be an issue for everybody. In fact, it's entirely possible that some audience members will find the latter factor in particular a positive. I'm sure there are some people who consider his other work to be on the crass and sensationalistic side. And, you know, I think there are times where they have a point. Scarface's profanity, for instance, is bordering on the absurd. It has over 200 instances of the F word alone. Um, that's like, you know, more than one a minute for the whole runtime. Uh, close to two, in fact. Uh, but one aspect of this film, uh, The Fury, that I think is unmistakably a weakness is its antagonists. The shadowy conspiracy that is snatching psychics and studying them has only rather nebulously defined goals. Also, given what we do know of their goals, it's hard to see exactly how their actions really serve that agenda. Or at least they're not the best way to serve that agenda. Kidnapping people and then holding them against their will requires considerable resources, not just to accomplish, but to conceal. Because, you know, when people go missing, somebody's going to miss them. Um, and it also seems unlikely to make your victims cooperate with you. When you add the fact that these victims have unpredictable powers, it seems a very high-risk strategy indeed. Much better to stick with the more softly, softly, we're here to help approach they originally used with Gillian. Now, once you get past the, net set, the, net, the neat set pieces that the plot sets up through these, through these decisions of the antagonists and just think about the story beats themselves and whether they make sense, they do start to look rather forced and artificial. And it's definitely a weakness for the film that you know, the more you think about it, the less it makes sense. So yeah, that's the Fury. It's, in my opinion, a little disappointing overall. Next time, filmed in 1976 but not released until 1979, it's the pre-slasher movie, slasher film, Savage Weekend. So it is a slasher film, but it was made pre-kind of slasher movies. But that's next time. Until then, thanks for watching this video, and I hope you enjoyed it.